from UX research to UX knowledge by Zatorian Klammer, PhD. Please. <laughs> thank, thank you so much and thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Also, I'm really happy to be here. I'm even more happy to be here after Sabrina's talk. Um, and I will, um, for sure, you will see there will be some similarities even between our talks. So, even happy about that. Um, yeah, just a few words about myself. I'm also a psychologist by heart, really, I have to say. Um, but also, I wanted to become a, a pro as elementary teacher when I was a small kid. So think about that um, when I'm closing the talk, because actually this talk also brought me back to thinking about what did I want to become when I grow up. So yeah, keep that in mind. Um, I, I'm here now for the second time, um, and I'm actually doing my first job in Austria. So the company George Labs is my first um, employment in Austria because I was abroad for a lot of time but I'm from Graz, so I'm originally from this town. Um, and so I'm even more happy to be here in Graz to talk about um, user research. And yeah, I think for me it's important um, not only to bring a lot of input today, but to discuss it with you and hopefully there's yeah, a lot in for you. So at the moment I'm working at George Labs. I don't know, does anybody know George? Yeah, there are some choices. Okay, I'm happy. <laughs> um, for the others, George is a uh, banking functionality, a banking app um, from Erste Group countries, from Erste Group Banking. Um, we have it in six countries. I will show a few slides about this. I don't talk about George too much about the product, but more about the user research we are doing. But good to know that we have some Georges around us. Yeah, as you see, you might not know that George has more than 8 million users. Yes, we are from Austria. It started this idea from Austria but um, have it live in many countries and therefore also in, um, um, for many users. So um, you can imagine that it's not easy to plan something to do user research for so many customers in so many countries. This is also why I need my colleagues from other countries like Romania a lot um, and where we need to change a lot about um, UX research. Um, yeah, here again, all the countries we are in at the moment, so we have those six countries, Austria being the first, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania, Croatia, and Hungary. Um, so you see all together we have, of course, in the Erste Group more than 16 million customers, not all of them, of course, using the banking, um, but yeah, as you can see, half of them. And the funny thing is also that you might think, yeah, banking app is a small thing, right? You just have to do transfers and payments. It's not just one number for you, um, at least only in Austria, in my team, in, in Austria, in the central team, we have more than 24 product squads, product teams. So a lot of features inside this small um, functionality of a banking app. All right, um, give me some credit. I tried a prototyping tool. So this presentation is not in PowerPoint. It's in a design tool called Figma. Somebody knows Figma? And I'm so proud that I did it the first time. So. This burger was built by me. I'm really bad at designs. <laughs> this should be a burger. So what does this burger mean? Um, so what we try to do in the UX research teams in, in church throughout all countries is that the meat, the thing where it really comes to, is the empirical UX research. I can use empirical in this crowd, right? Because back in my office, people don't know so much about empirical and what it means. But for you, I can say it. Um, we have also somebody in our team who is doing like trends and technologies, so um, people who know everything about new features in the market. And of course, we're doing a lot of research ops, um, bringing me also back later to the talk when it comes to communicating research, building the infrastructure for research. So this is actually like the founding, it's really the bread. It holds everything else, right? And yeah, on top we try to communicate and involve the team by co-creation. So this is the burger. I should ask a designer colleague maybe to make another burger for me. <laughs> or Anna, maybe. Um, and yeah, we use, I think, the same methods as everybody of you would use, um, the key methods, and don't go into details about the methods too much. Um, you should all know them. We're doing all of them, basically, throughout all the phases. Um, but yeah, I think one of the most important ones, of course, are always the qualitative ones and the ones where we try to learn and understand more about the user. Okay. But today it's not about methods. Today it's about this problem. Um, do you ever feel like this? Product owner coming to your couch? Maybe if you are a psychologist, you understand why I put the couch there. Um, 
So often I have the feeling a product owner is coming to us or to me with a research request like, yeah, we have a new feature going on, we have the design already kind of done and we just need to know, do the people like it? So that's basically their concern. They talk about this a lot, they come to the couch and I'm like, yeah, but you know what? We don't just ask the user, do you like the product? That's not what we aim for, right? But this is really often the case, sometimes often when it's too late in the process, when the design is already fixed or like, you can only do some fine tuning maybe in the end. So this is for me already the problem that the product owner or, um, comes with this request. What does it mean? What I want to focus on today is to um, tell a little story about that user research is not about this question. Of course, we also ask the user, and do you like it? And how attractive is it? And blah, blah, blah. All this kind of stuff. And of course, the benefit and the value. But I think the core goal of user research and doing anything should not be to know in the end, is it good or bad? Because the answer to this question, like, do the users like my product could be yes or no? What do you do with that? Nothing, right? You cannot really evolve, you cannot improve something. It's just, okay, nice, we launch it, but we don't, actually don't know why. So maybe it's also a risk. And what do I want to say with that? I think that not yet, or maybe some of us already achieved that, um, build UX research or UX knowledge already. Because for me, research is not equal in knowledge, like just like that. Just because you research people and you ask a lot of questions and you tell the product owner, you know what they told us, blah, blah, blah. It's not building knowledge already, right? You need to do some more stuff to build knowledge and um, maybe to change something in the other people's mind. So what is the problem? <laughs> Duh, 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 duh. It's us, <laughs> it's the UX research process. It's how we do UX research at the moment. It also has to do with self-marketing and putting us on the plate of, I don't know, strategic meetings or whatever you need to do to involve stakeholders. But the problem really often is, and I think I have, you had almost the same, the same slide, so I think um, we all know this. Often the problem is the researcher knows best, right? So it's like, ah, Julia, what did the user say one year ago about this feature? And what if I'm not there, right? Who will answer this question? So the researcher knows best, which is not so good, I think. Often a little involvement of, of the product team. Sometimes they might, they might just come to your result presentation. Maybe they join a workshop. Maybe they forget everything throughout the way. Maybe one really engaged product owner listened to a customer interview. That's already cheering up. And really often, um, I'm trying to get away from that, but really often you still have like high level reports or if you outsource it even, and that's where the agency comes in, you get those reports back, you read them, maybe you don't even read them and you forget them, right? So, and the more insights there are in this report, the more you forget about them because it's just too much. So how do you get up with that problem? And I think why this is my talk about the in-house agency, I think it's because sometimes there was a girl talking about this, I think it was you with the black shirt, she doesn't see me now. <laughs> um, that sometimes it feels like UX researchers are like the service team inside the company, it was you, right? Um, so we are servicing all the product teams and of course we are happy to serve all these customers of, yes, I can do this research and yes, I can also do this research and of course there you go, here is your knowledge. But it's not like this, you cannot deliver knowledge, you cannot just bump it there and just say, there's your knowledge, now go and get crazy ideas out. So this is the problem, nothing changes, or often, I'm putting up really bad examples here, often nothing changes. So, but, why do we do user research? Why do we research anything? Does anybody have a clue? Why did the men and women, hundreds of years ago, research anything, experiment on anything? Does anybody have a clue? Yeah, in the back, you have to shout. Yeah, pretty good. More efficient, yeah. Any other idea what's, what's more efficient, actually? I will sew it because I don't put it on the plate. Yeah, sorry. True. 
And why are we curious? Yeah, there's a last word. Now it's getting interesting. <laughs> to predict, yeah. Well, maybe it's trickier. In the end, we want to improve something. We want to be more efficient. We want to improve our life, right? We want to change something in the end. I know it is sounds so simple. Yeah, of course, we want to change something. Well, change the world. But keep in mind that um, in order to change something, we first have to learn something. And learning is not just, here you have your knowledge, now go change, right? And that's the problem. And I'm trying to um, compare learning and UX research. So this is what I'm about to do in the second part now of this talk. So change needs learning. And when you look at some definitions of what learning actually is, is learning is a change in behavior. That's funny, right? So it's somehow um, the same thing. Um, but this change in behavior, this learning needs experience. So how do you experience a research report? You read it, OK? Do you dance around it? Do you play with it? Do you throw it in the air? I don't know. You don't really do something with it, right? So often a research report or a result or whatever is presented to you. It's delivered. It's like back in the times when the teacher is speaking in front of you, blah, blah, and just listening and then like, yeah, this is a nice insight. Then you go out and maybe you remember it, right? But in really many cases, you don't remember because the human brain works like this. It cannot remember all the knowledge we just put into this tiny, big but tiny brain. So what I said before, knowledge cannot be delivered. It's not just, it cannot just give it to you. Um, and this is why also UX research or the output of UX research cannot just be given to you. And I deliver this research now, I'm done, and there you go. And now I used your quote. I immediately put a picture of Sabrina from the morning here because I found it so, 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 so awesome. And it's actually the best hook for my talk now for the second part. It's actually this one um, quote that you were, you were uh, showing today. The job of a UX researcher is not to learn about the user or the product, it's to help the team learn. And that's exactly what I want to talk about. So shout out again to this. And I think we can all use this as the one quote for every researcher. So I'm sorry I have no sound, but do you know Charlie Brown? Who is still old enough to know Charlie? Who does not know Charlie Brown? OK. Ah, oh, you're too young. <laughs> so, um, do you know what the noise is in the background? Rah, 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 rah. And I find this so funny because it's really like this, right? They're sitting in school and the teacher, or I think all the grown ups, don't have a voice, right? They're just like, wah, 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 wah. And this is, <laughs> this is what I feel a lot of time about talking about user research. We have one hour results meeting and we're talking and we're talking. Often I find myself, talking and talking and talking. I'm like, of course, after this one hour, they're just pff, overwhelmed and blown away, but not in a good way, <laughs> like just overwhelmed in the end. So why is learning so hard? Why is it so hard to, if we tell all these stories about users, to remember them, to take them, and you know, like be inspired and say, like, ah, that's the reason why I don't use it. Now I can do this or that. So what, why is this so hard? And there are many reasons. There's not enough time. There's not enough people to learn about this. Not enough product owners who have time to get their people listen to us researchers, not knowing where to search or where to listen or where the research researchers even sit or where they put all their awesome knowledge. And really often, um, what we tell them is sometimes too abstract or cannot be experienced. Because for us, it's clear we listen to hundreds of users. It's all in our brain, right? It's even in our heart sometimes. But to express this to another person is not that easy. Now we give you a really complicated picture now, which is called the simple model of the human brain. Don't look at it. I summarized it because <laughs> you can look it up later. Um, the human brain basically needs two things to remember stuff, and to put it into your long-term memory, like to use it really. Focus, like this. Are you listening now? I hope so. And engagement. I'm not dancing around now, I'm not forcing you to dance, but you need some engagement, and I think we all know that from our childhood. We learn by playing. We do something with this stuff, right? And this is how we learn it. 
we don't play around in the office so much. So I think we're losing that a little bit. And those are the two things I want to focus on for today. So what I brought today, and this is not a second part where it comes to my examples from work, from George Labs where I work with, um, is to bring you many examples of like, I don't want to call them principles because I did not really invent them. I just found five examples to kind of um, work on this focus and engagement. And coming back to Sabrina and also many other talks before, I think working on focus and engagement is or should be half of your work, I guess, 50%. Like 50% is research, 50% is just try to focus and engage other people about what you did. So I brought you these five things. Um, let's call them the Julia principles <laughs> at George. <laughs> no, I'm not that famous. Um, but those are five things that I now understood by preparing this talk um, are actually going back to the human brain, to learning, and actually pretty easy. And it's all going back to think about when you were in school, how did you memorize stuff? How did you remember stuff? How did you find stuff? Now it is the internet, but back then it was more difficult. Um, where did it actually happen? Only in the classroom, or somewhere else. Um, how did you engage? Do you remember when you were marking your scripts, your books? Do you mark reports now? Maybe sometimes, but maybe we also lose that because of no physical engagement. And did you learn all at once? No. You are here now because you learned for many years, right? So these five things I will try to tackle. First thing, make insights digestible <laughs> and memorable. With digestible, I don't mean they should be good news only. Um, it's about small chunks of information. So don't give away everything at once, right? Try to make it small clusters, small things that everybody should be able to focus and remember in a way. And this can be easily done. There are many blog articles about that by trying to create stories or using associations or metaphors. So not something new, right? It's just thinking about that and trying to make all that you found out a bit more digestible and memorable. And I'll try to show you something. Who knows this? Schnitzel? Yeah, I hope so. Did you eat schnitzel today? No, it was not, no. This looks better. <laughs> no. mm. So this was from a study we did um, two years ago when we, when we started to research a lot on business customers, not retail customers when it comes to George. And um, there was something about schnitzel. And I will tell you the story. Um, the product was actually helping to um, make onboarding to get a new account, a new business account digitally, right? So you don't have to go to the branch. You can, do, you can do it all digitally. And for a business customer to sign up, it takes much more, right? So we have to ask you a lot of questions as a bank because otherwise we cannot trust you. We have to know where is your business? Are you doing legal business or not? Lots of questions. And inside all those questions is also that you have to state kind of who are your business partners. Like, do you have trustworthy business partners? Or is it, I don't know, some weird company you are dealing with? So you have to state in some forms your business partners. And this was a really unclear um, thing because the form was really long and there was like business partner, business partner, business partner, business partner. And a lot of clients were like, yeah, but how many do you have to tell you all my business partners now? And there was one quote by one quite Austrian company owner. He said like, <laughs> I should even say it in Styrian, but it's not... That's translatable. Um, he said like, yeah, if I state every business partner I'm selling a schnitzel, you know what? I have to fill out hundreds of forms for this. So this schnitzel um, was really the one quote that was so important for us to understand, hey, nobody knows how many business partners to put in, where to put them in, and if it should be all or just the biggest ones or whatever. So we called it the schnitzel gate. And I used this picture, the schnitzel, as the one picture for this insight. It was just about this one insight, right? And I think what is funny about this is that not only you would remember it, but it's also fun, right? It's also fun to read about this. It's not like, ah, what's this schnitzel doing here? It's like, hey, what's this schnitzel doing here? I want to find out, right? The curiosity again kicks in. And you know what's also nice about making small chunks? 
even if the project team afterwards would only solve this issue, a lot would have changed, or actually we changed it. So I think if you can um, make them smaller, you also make it easier for other people to act on this because they know, yes, we want to get away from this schnitzel problem. More ideas on how to make insights more and more memorable. Here's a blog article about um, why research is boring, or shouldn't be boring. And another one was <laughs> actually also a fun case, also about business users. Um, it's about accountants. Does anybody know accountants? Is somebody an accountant? So accountants work with a lot of Excel sheets, big, um, big data templates. So they're used to really work with banking apps in a not so emotional way, right? There's not like, oh my God, this is the banking application, yes. They're looking at this every day, they're doing payments every day, they're preparing everything for the CEO. So it's a rather not dry, but really structured role to have to do. And what we found out is that really accountants really do everything after each thing. So step by step, they would not like, oh, I'm doing a transfer now, ah, and now I'm checking out the balances, and now I'm doing another transfer. No, they really have their procedure of how they do things, and you cannot mix it up. And I was like, who else is doing that? Oh, I don't know where I'm heading at. Serial killers. <laughs> so we use this as an example for saying, hey, remember, accountants are like serial killers. Don't mix up their procedure. Yeah, it's really, <laughs> this one was hard to get through, but it was, I think it was even on some board meetings. So <laughs> we had this emoji with the serial killer. Um, and of course, that's fun now, but it's really, really easy to remember. And every time somebody speaks about the serial killer, they know, ah, yes, this is the thing. We have to remember that. So these are easy tricks, actually. Just take some time to take the time to think about it. Actually, I know this. Maybe there's a pattern from real world about this issue. So I have a really dry mouth, sorry. I was at a conference also the last two days, so my voice is already gone. All right, second. Also not so easy. It seems so easy, right? There's a research a a report A, B, C, but after some years, and now I'm three years with George Labs, I'm also having troubles finding stuff I did. And like when somebody asks me, you really do remember there was a project about this or that? What did the user say back then? I'm like, no clue, how can I find out, right? And mostly, I don't know how it's with you, I'm searching for the date and maybe Maybe I know the project, maybe I know the people I did it with, but it's pretty hard to find stuff, even for myself. It's somewhere there, but I don't know. And I really thought a lot about how can I not become this walking lexicon? Because what if I die, or I don't know, not die, but uh, I'm, on my, I'm soon on maternity leave. So what, what when the baby's coming and nobody can ask me anymore? And I think, I don't know, who is the only UX researcher in a company at the moment? You should know what I talk about. <laughs> so what if you're not there? What if you, if you leave the company? Hopefully not, but um, all this knowledge should not just be gone because you are not there or not, I don't know, as quick as possible to just find this answer. And I don't want to promote tools here, but actually we use one tool I have to promote, so I cannot not say the name, but I will say it really quickly. Um, but we, used, um, we use a new tool now since two and a half years. It's actually Insight Repository. Anybody familiar with that? You should, you really should. I really encourage you. Even if it's not one tool for all, and there are many out there, but um, I'm really a fan of it. We're trying to do it more and more. And it's basically, well, let's say, our mission with this tool is um, to have kind of a book about the user. Like I can open this book, but it's better than a book I can search. Like a Google search about users. And in our case, we use Dovetail. I know it's really small, and doesn't even show all of it, but you can look it up afterwards. It's Dovetail, you, should, you could know about it. And it's basically our one repository, so we don't have presentations anymore, nothing. Sometimes from the other countries <laughs> we get presentations, but we try to put them here. So the idea is everything is in this tool, everything is searchable, so when I, when I search like for business partners, I would find this project, I would even find this quote, if I wrote it in the right way. So you can use this search, which is really nice for product owners to go there and like, yeah, what do we know about, I don't know, signing or the new transfer or whatever. 
And what we also try to do is, it's really, really blurry, sorry for that. So down there you, you will find, we still call them reports, so that stakeholders know where to go. But it's like little stories with a lot of pictures with all those kinds of schnitzels and serial killers. Um, sometimes even smaller ones. And above, yeah, we try to do a newsletter also on this. But all, and this is a lot of work, it's hell of work. Because this is just communication. This is like writing blog articles about what you do. But I can assure you it's worth the effort. In the beginning a bit like, uh, but you, you get there. So I think it's really worth and it's nice because people can comment on it. People can work with this knowledge and not just always get this big rep re report and then, yeah, be scared about this report. There are other tools as well. So it's not the only one and it's also not the best, but it's as far as good. All right, accessibility. Go where the action happens. Ooh, you think this might be a party? It's not, but um, maybe this is a hard question, but we accidentally came into the action or where the action happened also in this big project about business users. Um, and in the end, it was pretty clear where we should be at the end. What's the end of the, uh, building a feature? Or what's the last step of building a feature? Any developers in the house? Not today? Yeah. But in the end, it's a developer who implements the stuff, right? The awesome big ideas, which are then also quite awesome designs, and they end up in development. Hopefully, there's still this <laughs> awesome idea. But the developers are the last to act with it. They are the last to engage with all of it. So how can we go where the developers are? And where are they? Behind the screens? Somewhere in Tira. <laughs> Nobody shouting. Okay. Somewhere in a tool where all the, can you explain to you? In a, somewhere in a tool where developers handle all their tickets, everything they have to do. One of them is Tira. Yeah, Tira. <laughs> so, and, and I would never expect in my life that I would say, I'm happy I'm in Tira, but I am because I show you why. These are two Tira tickets. Don't pay attention to the text there. It's really complicated uh, language. But this is how a Jira ticket looks like. So it says something about maybe a user story, maybe a requirement, maybe the people who should act on it. But there's a tiny thing now. And we're like really proud of this tiny thing. Do you see the labels? Customer feedback. And on the right side, requested by customers. So we managed to get a label which is about UX research or about customers. We call them now differently. Those are old labels. But still, we are in Jira having a label which says, yes, this comes from customer research, or yes, this was validated by customer research, and more labels. I know this sounds not really boring, but for me, it's like, oh my god, <laughs> we are in Jira. We talk the same language as developers. So it's really a big thing. I don't say it's the only and best solution, because we also saw that the moment we made it as small as a Jira ticket, we could not sell anymore the whole story, the whole context of why is this ticket now here? What does it have to do with accountants and being serial killers? So it's still some work to do to bring it back, to map it to the bigger story, but at least some info is there. And the awesome thing is we try to link Jira to Dovetail. So you would find a link to Dovetail, to an inside, to a schnitzel inside Jira. That's what we're trying, it's also a lot of work. <laughs> but it's kind of working. All right, hardest one, I know. The first three ones are pretty easy or pretty, let's say, if you are a fun person, if you have fun about communicating research, you will find your ways doing it. The engage part is a bit more difficult. It also needs sometimes the buy-in from stakeholders, from people who are not often doing research, but there are ways, but I think and I think, who said it before? I think before we said it, we had it in a talk before. At some point, you have to do everything to get some people in and engage with your stuff, right? Be it in a workshop, be it whatever, but try to do that. One example I can give to you, same, <laughs> same slide as with Sabrina, because it's only one researcher, so we can never do the research for all the team, for all the people. It's also unrealistic that everybody becomes a researcher. I also not want everybody to become a researcher because I don't know if this is valid then and good research. 
Um, but one thing we tried, and this is one example, I don't have the answers to all of this engage part, but one thing we tried, um, it's called scorecard. It's even a template on Miro, so it's not too hard to do. Um, and it's also not something that is not invented by me or anybody, has been there forever. Um, so this is a scorecard. The, the names in the columns are just names of a user in a user testing. So first participant, second participant. Um, and we had key questions, like leading questions for um, this project or product we were testing. And the idea was that most of the team should listen. I think it was the product owner, business analyst, and copywriter. So at least three people from the team should listen to the interviews. Not all of them, but try. And instead of just listening, make notes. It's so easy. I know it sounds like, oh my god, I have to make notes. But if you make it a bit easier to write a post-it, put it on an awesome board, Digitally, it's a bit easier. It doesn't seem like, oh my God, I have to do like transcripts. And it's also not about transcripts. It's not even about the post-its. It's about the other people writing post-its, engaging with the content. And I think as soon as they've done it, like, they were like, yeah, now we found it all by ourselves. It's so interesting. La, la, la. I was like, yeah, there you go. I didn't even, funny thing, I didn't have to write a report here. There was no report. We just had a wrap-up meeting after the last... Um, participant or the next day documented it together and there it was. No report, no big story needed, right? So I think it depends really on, and this is not so much time. I know you cannot get three people to listen to five customers all the time, but maybe you get two people to listen to three customers or two or distributed over the team. And just by writing the notes, it gets to your long-term memory. Think about school again. You had the script, but the moment you started writing something, summarizing what you read, this is the moment where stuff went to your long-term memory. Small examples, I think you can do much more of this, but you have to prepare them, of course. This needs your work, but as I said, I saved the reporting, I saved the analysis, I just needed the time for preparing the workshop. So you can calculate yourself what is easier or better. Last thing, um, we don't learn er everything at once. This is a bit now more meta, not so much hands-on, um, but it's really about don't try to answer all the questions with one research study or one project or one awesome usability testing. It's not possible and it should also not be the expectation, right? Because sometimes it's like, so we have this big flow now, go test it. And then you take this big flow, you bring it to the customer and then like, yeah, it was quite okay, but and there comes 20 bots, and they're like, oh my God, there are 20 bots? Yeah, we don't have the time, so okay, let's not do it, or let's just tackle one of the problems. But if you come with small things, small questions, maybe just a few buttons, a few screens sometimes where you're unsure or whatever, it's much easier. And there's a nice blog article about this. I don't want to go too much into this theoretical stuff, but um, there's a guy reading about, uh, writing about how to stop UX research being a blocker on Medium, and he's um, separating directional research from foundational research. I think it's pretty understandable what he wrote. I'm not going to it, but the one thing, the one message I want to get away with is um, you can also do directional research, which means finding stuff out turn by turn, little stuff, a bit the agile, agile way, right? And not always plan the big ethnographic study about every feature that you're encountering. And one thing how you can do it or how we try to do it at the moment, that's still like mission for the next many years for me at George Labs, we try to build our own kind of test committee. I think there are a lot of people who do this. So I think this is also nothing new, but we really try to use it in a way where it's a bit more quick, maybe dirty, no, it's not, it's not dirty. It's actually quick, but not dirty. Um, because we are researchers, we don't do that dirty work. No, it's quick, um, but often pretty tiny questions. So it can only also be a way we just show one screen where we are unsure. Lately, we showed something about a screen, mainly about a graph, where we are really unsure, is this graph helping? Or should we just get rid of it? So this is the stuff we're doing. We're also doing it for business customers to build this kind of lead user test programs. All this kind of stuff to just make it a bit easier to get a few answers to 
a tiny problem or a tiny part of the problem. And we're a bit proud because we use this now internally only as a test case. So our community is not live yet. It's just internal with employees and other people. And we got 80 answers to a question in less than an hour. And we were like, what? So many people answer to this one thing. But again, since it's one question, it's easy to act on. It's easy to give feedback. If it's a big survey with 20 questions, they're like, oh, they want to know all about my financial health and blah, 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 and what I think about that and what I think about this. But yeah, I can give feedback to this one screen. Easy. So it's again the same thing. Focus and engage on small things. And it also helps us in recruiting. We were not aware of this because we have a big recruiting problem, as everybody has. We are a bank. We are not a bank. We cannot just directly go to the bank. Clients, we have to um, ask them. So this also helps us in recruiting, which is a nice side effect. All right. So summary for you, takeaway. You can use whatever you want from it. Um, I think these are just examples, right? It's not like the whole answer, not the whole solution, but some stuff we tried and some stuff we're still trying. I have to be honest, it's a lot of work. And I think my job as a moment as the team lead is basically just thinking about that. I'm trying to do the research also a little bit, but um, yeah, trying to get this idea and communicate research. I think this is really, I think even Susan Weinshank said it in the morning, communicative skills. You have to have that as a researcher, otherwise, it's getting lost. And yeah, maybe just some uh, end message. Um, what you exercise should be or not, or what it should be. Um, I think it should not be a tool to confirm stuff, to say, yeah, everything is good, everything is not good, or um, a product is nice in every way. I think it should be a possibility for a team to, again, focus on a problem together, not more. Maybe this is all you need to care about focus together on a problem, on a topic, um, and then you get a lot of aha uh -huh moments. So coming back to learning, teaching, I think um, what we see in all our world is that everything is an experience. Every report, every insight we get, it doesn't have to be UX research, it can also be tracking, it can be big data, it can be your guts, it can be your experience in the company. Everything is experience, everything is data. So everything is learning. Just just focus and engage. Thank you. Thank you for the insights in George Labs. It's open for questions. We have time for two, three questions. One, two. <laughs> Thank you so much. I loved, I loved your talk. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that there are 24 squads that work on the banking app. Um, and I know there's been other talks about the orga organizational structure of UX teams, um, but I'm curious, I would love to implement everything you just talked about, but when you are working in an organization that's very product driven, where you have POs coming to your therapy couch mm -hmm. and saying, just give me the confirmation that this works before we release it, um, do you have any tips for kind of pushing back on them and saying we need um, a more sophisticated approach? Um, I, I'm just curious if you have a thought on that. Mm, what I try more and more is first to say, no, <laughs> I cannot give you confirmation, just that. But also, um, first, if you want to know more about the user, you have to give me more. So do you have data? Do you have some hypothesis, what you think could be a problem or an issue? And sometimes they go back and say like, yeah, let me look if I have some data and also have to invest some work. So I want to have them a bit more invested themselves before they just you know, go there and say, do something, tell me what users think. And sometimes there is a lot of stuff already there that just need to you know, find out and combine data, insights or stuff, but I try to give a bit of responsibility back. That's something I try. Not always working, but <laughs> Thank you. often. Okay, so um, hi. Uh, you mentioned that you are involving. You, the, you mentioned yeah. that you are involving the whole team in the process of trying to engage them in the user research, right? What is the whole team? Are you also involving the developers in it? Yeah, or? yeah, no. This team was the, the one example. 
no, back then it was a developer. Now he became a product owner. So actually, it was a developer back then in this example. No, we also try to involve developers. It's a bit harder. This is for sure true. Um, but I think it's funny. You have to, I think you have to find the right methods where also developer-rich people can shine. And it's not the stage sometimes, right? It's not like talking out in front of people. So sometimes we try to do workshops where they can write down stuff and they don't have to be as outgoing as maybe, I don't know, product owners are. So I think it's about giving everybody another tool to participate. It doesn't have to be every tool, like the same tool for everybody. So I think when I, I have one example, where I did a design sprint where we included user research. And at the end, the developer was like the one guy. He had the best, not the best idea, but he was really pushing an idea through the whole design sprint. We were like, oh, interesting. He was <laughs> never on the plate so far. So I think it depends on which tools you give each person to shine, to give voice to. But that's, that takes time, of course, to find that. Uh, okay, thank you. We're not excluding them, but <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they're hard to pull out of their two, uh, two, two monitors. One more question. Thank you, Julia. Um, I would like to ask you, how would you start to recruit a test community if you would have been able to start now? So what, what? would be the first step? <laughs> Just the first step. I knew it would be too uh, long. Where would, you, where would I start, honestly? With the legal shit. Mm -hmm. Because this is causing us, or this is taking our time since one year. I know it's not a f the most fun thing now to tell, but um, the legal stuff and all the organizational stuff is the first thing you have to care about. It's not about, oh my God, what awesome stuff can we do for the user? No, start with the shit part, which is the legal part in a company, in a, at least in a big company, like a banking regulated organization. Thank you so much. Start with that. <laughs> One last question. Um, in terms of cross uh, collaboration between um, basically the, the UX researcher and perhaps more of the, the UX designer within the embedded teams, what would you say is generally kind of an ideal target for how much research the designer might be doing versus what mm -hmm. the researcher would be dedicated to? Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, I mean, for us, it's a bit easier because we have like 16 designers and like four research, three researchers at the moment. So we can kind of you know, working not in pairs, but we can like distribute over designers and like scale up in that way to the whole team. Um, and it, there's no answer to that because it depends so much on the designer. Some designers are really eager to do research and take away a lot of the stuff that you would do. And some others are like, I have no clue. And I also don't want to speak to users. It's not my thing. So I think you cannot answer the question right. It, but I think you can build that kind of team. So then it's easier. And I th still think that not every designer needs to do research or has to be skilled for research. He has to be open or she to do that or to support it. But you cannot force every, pa every person to go out there and ask customers. I want to force all the designers. <laughs> we just had the idea of forcing all the designers to go out monthly with a prototype to the next cafe. Maori, like our boss boss said that. Let's see <laughs> if we're gonna do that. Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you very much. And after thank the coffee you. break, there will be one more interesting presentation here in this room. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Have fun.